good morning again. Um, it's been great to get to chat with many of you since yesterday and get to learn your stories. There's so many really impressive companies that are represented in this room. Um, yesterday I talked about strategy and I talked about purpose as a catalyst for strategy. Today I'm going to talk about uh, an area within strategy that we refer to as strategic foresight. And when I was listening to Brian, I was thinking, oh my gosh, did I put future proofing on the title slide? <laughs> Fortunately, I did not. Um, it's been really interesting to see so much similarity and interconnecting themes across the presentations. So I think that was a master stroke from Jeremy and Lisa as you guys worked with all of us. So I think you'll see some points of connection from the two people that we've already heard from this morning. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define what strategic foresight is. I'm gonna tell you why I think it's really important. I'm gonna show you how we approach it at VF, and I'm gonna give you a view into how we're thinking about the future, and then I'll leave you with a few pieces of advice if it's something that you think would be useful for your business. Okay, so what is strategic foresight? Strategic foresight is really about finding opportunity through the fog of the unknown about what comes tomorrow. It's not about predicting the future, but it's about envisioning what it might be and asking yourself, how can that create new opportunity for us in ways that maybe our competitors are not yet thinking about? So why does foresight matter? I would suggest to you that the investment thesis behind every business in here, and the quality of it, and the value of your company is very much linked to the assumptions that you're making about the future, okay? And this is more relevant than ever because as every speaker has said, the world is changing at crazy rates. And so we have to be on our toes as we think about what may be happening next. And the quality of your strategy, the quality of your business case is only as good as those assumptions that you're either implicitly or explicitly making. So remember, what are the four most important words in strategy? What must be true? In this case, I'm talking about what must be true regarding the external environment outside of your four walls and how that may change for tomorrow. So let me give you a very practical example of how this may be useful. UPS is one of the early users of foresight and scenario planning in the corporate world. And if you go back to, uh, it was probably 10, 15 years ago, executives at UPS were worried about the next outbreak of avian bird flu. And that was quite uh, foreshadowing what we're dealing with today. So they went through some exercises, they developed some contingency plans about what they would do should that happen. All right, so put that on hold for a minute and let me show you this image. This is from April 14th, 2010. Does anybody know what this might be? <coughs> it's a volcano, obviously. I'll give you a hint, Iceland. Does anybody remember what happened then? What happened, shout it out. Yes, that's right. So this volcano, whose name I cannot pronounce, um, erupted, it sent ash 30,000 feet high above, high above Europe, and as you say, it created the greatest airline disruption since World War II. So it stranded, uh, or it grounded really, thousands of flights. It stranded many, many people. I was actually in London at the time and have my own uh, planes, trains, and automobile story for how I got back to the United States. If you're curious, I can share it with you later. But when this happened, somebody in Atlanta remembered, you know what? A couple years ago, we did this exercise around avian bird flu, and they pulled out the contingency plans, and they were very, uh, they were quickly, they were able to very quickly put them in place so that they could keep their planes flying and avoid disruption to their delivery system, okay? So the moral of this example, the moral of the story is that, again, you can't predict the future, you can't future-proof yourself, but you can be prepared for it by being thoughtful about what might happen. So at VF, we use three simple steps to help us think about what the future might bring and therefore how can we best, best be prepared for it. So the first step is thinking about what we call forces of change. And these are tectonic shifts in society that are real and present and they're here and we all deal with them. The second thing we do is we take these forces of change and we build them into simple scenarios or stories of what the world might look like. So Brian talked to us about 1730. We built four stories for 2030. 
and I'll show you those in a minute. And then we look into those stories and we imagine ourselves living in those different scenarios and we say, well, what kind of opportunity would this create for us that as a global company, we can start to prepare ourselves for today? And the end result of all of this, why we even bother doing this, is that we have a responsibility as a global company to maintain a healthy pipeline of businesses and ideas that can sustain our company, not just in the short term, so horizon one that you see there, but also in horizons two and three. And there's a key belief that we have, and it's, it's, uh, it's not necessarily a certainty, but it's a key watch out, and that watch out is that you cannot assume that your core businesses are going to remain your high growth, high profit businesses forever. Why is that? Because the world changes. Consumer preferences change, the way that consumers want to engage with brands change. So we have to make sure that we have a pipeline of different ideas that we can act on when the right moment comes. All right, so let me take you through each of the three, step, three steps. And as I do this, I'm gonna give you a sense for what we as VF think may be you know, important for, for us and our categories and our businesses. So we have six forces of change. Um, for the consumer brands in this room, your list might be pretty similar. There'd be some differences, I'm sure. Um, but hopefully these things will ring true for many of you. And again, we, we curated this list for the things that were important for us. So forces of change are tectonic shifts in social, technological, economic, environmental, and political factors. They're real, they're here, you can't deny them, and they will have an impact on every business in this room. So you really have to take them seriously. So let's go through them one by one. Neglected planet, and this links back very well to what Bex was just talking about. Our planet is reaching an environmental overload. We see rising temperatures, we see the fires in Australia, we see rising sea levels, we see air pollution in the world's biggest cities, right? So this is real and present, and it's here, and we have to deal with it, it affects all of us. And I wanna use this force of change as a moment to make the distinction between something that is pretty certain, which is climate change, versus something that is totally uncertain, which is the way that society is ultimately going to react to climate change. So as you look ahead to 2030, that could go in different directions. So that's the kind of thing that you would explore in a scenario, whereas forces of change, they're here, they're real, you can't deny them. The next is new world order. So with new world order, we see a shift in economic and cultural and military power from west to east. Globalization will evolve from being trade-based and Western-led to digital data-based and China-led. And this is happening because the United States, the United Kingdom, and other traditional brokers of global power are really stepping back. And China, while it is back on its heels at the moment, is very much leaning in to direct the future of how our world operates. And so this means that there will increasingly be two systems of business that every company in this, in this room is gonna have to understand and deal with. And in some cases, you might have to make choices between one or the other. Think about Huawei and what's happening with that business right now. The third example is disruption by data. And again, we've heard uh, elements of this through the last couple of days. But here you have an exponential growth in computing power that's really leading to a, an arms race, if you will, of the, there's some military language again, of the ability to mine data for as many insights as possible. And this is driven by technology that can increasingly sense and capture all of this data. So the predictive power of AI and machine learning is growing at rapid rates, which means that it can be applied to more and more things. For all the uh, marketing use cases in this room, you're going to be expected by your customers to be able to speak to them in a highly personalized way. AI can drive that. And really importantly, and this um, I think it's overlooked in a lot of cases, AI is changing the nature of work. And over the next decade, there will be millions and millions and millions of jobs that will go away because they can be automated. So think about the impact that that's gonna have for society. The fourth uh, force of change is what we call post-truth world. So in this force of change, there is no shared reality. Every single person in this room gets a different news feed, gets different search results, gets different ads delivered to them, 
and has different social media feeds. And what this leads to is that each of us lives in an increasingly polarized echo chamber where all we read and all we hear are things that we pretty much already, already believe. And so there's no more shared context, all right? So this leads to a crisis in trust where belief is overcoming data and evidence. This is the world that we live in. Next is what we call mosaic identities. As, and as a set of apparel and footwear brands, this is really important for us to understand. So with mosaic identities, millennials and Gen Z in particular are defining themselves and who they are in fundamentally different ways than before. They are using much more complex and fluid and internalized understanding of self-identity to say, hey, this is who I am. Traditional demographics like ACE, or ACE, age and race and gender, which maybe we're more used to using to try to type somebody, they're increasingly less important because everybody is different and everybody in younger generations in particular is defining themselves in much more fluid ways. So with this force of change, we say that ish is the new ism because people want a little bit of this, I stand for a little bit of that. That's how younger consumers are defining themselves. And then last but not least, limitless wellness. So with limitless wellness, there is an increasing focus on holistic health and wellness around the world. Not just physical wellness, but mental well-being and spiritual wellness as well. So on the physical side, this is being driven by an increased understanding of our bodies and DNA. It's being driven by technology that can inform us about individually you know, what our body is doing and we can monitor that. And on the mental well-being side, there's growing, and it's hard to prove this, but we would, we would con conjecture there's growing stress in the world. It's driven by people living in more and more crowded cities. It's driven by people having to convey who they are digitally, and that's really stressful for a lot of people. It's driven by people being less connected to nature, and I referred to that one yesterday in our Bring uh, Nature to Cities initiative at VF. So those are our forces of change, and again, they are real, they're lasting, they're here, and they're things that everybody in this room is gonna have to deal with as you think about the future of your business. So the next thing that we do is we take those forces of change and we build scenarios. So you can think of scenarios as integrated and extrapolated forces of change that are most relevant for your business, okay? So I have four that I wanna share with you. They're mapped neatly on a two by two grid for all of you ex-consultants in the room. I hope you appreciate that. Um, so let me take you through them real quickly one by one. So I'll start with slow local. So in a slow local world, communities and nations retreat and they turn inward to solve their own problems. Okay, so there's a major pushback against globalization and you can see this already in the unraveling of global trade deals, for example. There's a pushback against obtrusive um, advances in technology and there's a pushback against scientific possibilities like augmented biology, but people say, I don't want that. I don't trust that. In environmental reset, to the right, uh, climate change and environmental degradation take center stage, and you have an alignment of government and corporate agendas to try to address what's happening really in uh, reaction to a string of increasingly worse climate disasters. In health as wealth, imagine a world where health becomes the leading preoccupation for people worldwide. And you see a big increase in products and services and experiences that are brought about to address this. And then lastly, in techno royalty, the tech elites of the world that we all know about, they increasingly take power and governance into their own hands. Wealth and power concentrates in the hands of fewer and fewer people. Automation leads to very difficult things for society to deal with. So taken together, you feel really good about your children's future, don't you? Okay. Uh, we, did, we, did a, uh, we did a similar exercise around the future of retail. It was probably six or seven years ago. 
And I asked our international group president at the time, who was a veteran tried and true operator, I said, so when you look across these trends, what would be your no regret action? What would you do? And he said, retire, <laughs> I've got to retire. So that may be how you feel right now, but there is hope, I'll come to that in a minute. Um, so let me give you an example of one scenario, and this is environmental reset, so it builds perfectly on the, on the last uh, talk that we heard. So with each of the scenarios, we should be able to point to both signals that we see in the market today that would say, mm, yep, that's actually plausible, but also be able to paint a picture of holistically what does that mean, and then we want to mentally step into that picture and say, okay, well, if this is the world that we're living in, Hmm, what will we do? So in 2030, in an environmental reset scenario, what does it look like? So from a geopolitical standpoint, you have governments coming together and forming coalitions meant to address climate change because governments finally realize that they actually have to act together to address it. You have a rapid increase in regulation. You have carbon tax schemes around the world. You have uh, mm, big restrictions on water use and waste production. From an economic standpoint, you have a New Deal-like set of uh, programs fo focused on climate mitigation industries. You have big, advance, um, big investments by government and infrastructure. And in terms of consumer psyche, you know, especially in the West, most, um, you know, most cultures are very individualistic in nature in the West, but this changes here. You have much more of a collectivist mindset where people are more concerned about the safety of their community than they are about personal and individual comfort. So when you think about this world, it's very different than the reality that most of us live in today, but you can also imagine, you know what? That is plausible. So the whole point of us spending time to build these scenarios is in the value of the questions that they prompt for us. So I've given you some examples here that when we as a owner of global apparel and footwear brands, when we imagine ourselves in these scenarios, we say, hmm, what are some challenging questions this might make us address? So with Slow Local, I'll give you two examples. With Slow Local, what's the value of global brands and global infrastructure when communities and nations are turning inward and they're pushing back against globalization? What's the value of that? The purpose of this conference is to help you guys scale more globally, right? Well, if this was the world that you were living in, you would have to rethink some of your assumptions about how you make your business much bigger. Or an environmental reset, this ties back again perfectly to the talk that we just heard, how might brands thrive in an era of low consumption? You know, how Bex was describing the way that you put your office together is a perfect illustration of what this would look like. People are not wanting to buy new things. And the economics of probably almost every business in this room are based on an assumption that you're gonna sell more and more units and that's gonna make you more profitable. But in this scenario, you cannot count on that. So you have to think circular, you have to think services, you have to think of a different mix of businesses. Okay, all right, so I said there's hope. Let me take you to the third and final step, which is opportunity spaces. So an opportunity space is really a business opportunity, which is typically gonna be found at the intersection of an unmet consumer need, a change in technology, and or a change in your business model. So I don't wanna tip our hand too much here, but I have given you one example that I think is pretty, pretty uh, self-explanatory and, and obvious, and that's one that we call natural conscientious living. So in this space, and it's relevant for our industry, it's probably relevant to yours as well, what would it look like to be the true leader in environmental sustainability? And what would it mean to totally remove the guilt that consumers have from consumption? Consumers, us, people, we like newness. Why do you think we buy stuff all the time that we don't need? We like newness. How can you provide that to people, but do it in a way that really mitigates the environmental footprint? So you can see that we would say this opportunity space does really well against future possibilities because you know, we scored it as being relevant in three of our four scenarios. So this says, hmm, this is probably a space that we should think about. So for each of our spaces, we asked ourselves three questions. What do consumers wear? Because that's what we care about. How will they access it? And what do brands have to do to gain favor? So in this world, surprise, surprise, what consumers are wearing, they're wearing natural products think icebreaker type solutions. They're wearing products that have recycled content. They're wearing things that are regenerative, they come from regeneratively uh, farmed uh, sources. 
right? And blockchain, in this scenario, as an example, becomes a really critical enabler for you to prove that what you're offering has a low environmental uh, impact. So how do consumers access these things? They go to brands, they go to retailers, maybe they go to future digital apps that can validate the environmental um, impact. And how do brands gain favor? There's radical transparency in this scenario, not just uh, you know, showing, you know, proving that you know, this, this sweater came from such and such sheep station on the South Island and showing that, but you can even imagine in this scenario that businesses will make their P&L structure fully transparent to consumers. It's hard to imagine that today, right? But you do that because you wanna show consumers that you're responsible with the way that you use your resources. Okay. All right, so last slide. If this is something that you think, you know what? We might actually benefit from doing some of this. Here's a few pieces of simple advice. You don't have to make it complicated. Let me just give you a few pointers. The first is galvanize the team to join you. So. Everybody in this room probably knows somebody at the office who loves to send around articles. Hey, look at this, I just read this, it's really cool. These are the people that you want doing this because they love to pay attention to what's out there and what's relevant. Get those people together and start to make a list of stuff. Don't have to be precise about it. Ideas, things that you think are relevant and important to your business. Try to get to eight to 10 maybe. Now that list can quickly become overwhelming. You don't want 80 to 100. So use the filter of is this impactful to my business versus just interesting. So you really gotta think that through. Then once you have these trends and you kind of imagine them playing out, ask yourself, what would I do? What would I do different for my business today that could start to prepare me? Or if I see a certain trigger event, if X happens, then I'm gonna do Y and I might consider doing Z, okay? So most importantly, remember this is not about prediction. Nobody can predict the future, but it's about preparedness and making sure that as an owner of a business, you're thinking multi-generationally, if that's a word, and you're thinking not just about the current horizon that you're in, which of course is gonna be most of your focus, and it should be, but that you're spending just a little bit of time at least thinking about what may be coming around the corner, and to, to some extent, making some actions today that can prepare you for success then. So thank you very much. Hope that was helpful and interesting. Yeah, that was uh, extraordinary, David. Thank you so much. Um, so just picking up where you finished, it's not about prediction, uh, but is it about placing bets or? That's a great question. How do you think about that? Yeah, uh, it ultimately is about placing bets. Uh, if I can use a financial analogy, it's kind of like you want to buy a set of call options where if you, you know, buy at a certain price and the stock starts to take off, you can financially benefit from that. So the way that we would think about it um, at, at VF is we want a portfolio of ideas. Some of these ideas are things that our existing brands can do right now with the resources that they, they control. And some of these things might require new capabilities or new models uh, or possibly even different brands for us um, in the future. But we wanna have a pipeline of these things. So it's not about putting all of your eggs in one basket. It's about making a lot of very small bets against things that can create option value for you. So you can, you can almost think of it as like a, a, a VC type of mindset. Okay, so let's pick up on that idea of mindset. Um, a lot of people are more comfortable with the here and now. Sure. Uh, you come across to me as a pretty rational guy, but also you're very comfortable to step into an imagineering type space. So what type of mindset do you need? And how does this relate to that earlier question about effectively the underlying value in your company? You know, what type of mindset do you need to kind of take on this type of stuff? Do you need to shift how you're thinking about your business or how you think about planning? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I mean, it, it is, I would say, a, a different mindset than probably most people would have most of the time because, of course, you are focused on the here and now, and that's appropriate. Um, but here you need, sometimes I would refer to this as a bit of uh, magical thinking. You have to suspend disbelief for a moment, and you have to imagine that things could be, could be different. So in some cases, and it kind of goes back to the point I was making about find the people 
in your organization that'll send you articles. They send you articles most likely because they're very intellectually curious and they pick up on signals and they can see, ah, oh, this is actually relevant for us. So those people, I would suggest, probably have at least a bit of a different mindset than maybe some others in your organization and bring them into this process. So should you be trying to, you know, going back to the diversity comment, are you looking for diverse mindsets in the room or are you looking at almost harnessing the kind of forward thinking type people within your organization? Um, diverse mindsets are good. So it's, it's good to have, uh, one or two um, more critical people actually in the conversation because they'll call BS, right? And, and they'll force you to kind of elevate your thinking. And they'll say, mm, I don't buy that. And so it's a challenge back to you and say, you know what, you're right. That's probably, the odds of that happening are probably really low. Maybe we should focus here instead. And everyone loves hacks. Is, is it legitimate to have a hack like, uh, you've got your forces of change. Um, or you, you're kind of your, your, your one, yeah, you've got your, your one to six uh, big things about mosaic identity and limitless wealth, wellness, et cetera. Can, can we almost just simply look at our strategy and just ask ourselves, how will identity shift affect us? Maybe it's not relevant, mm -hmm. move on. Mm -hmm. Can you just almost go one to six or should you be creating your own one to six? And if so, how do you go about that? Mm. Yeah, um, you know, you're, you can start with these six, but you know, we curated these because we are in the business that we are in. So if you were a financial services startup in this room, you would probably think of some different ones. Mosaic identities, for example, making this up may not be as relevant, but there may be a force of change related to the changing role of money in our society, and that should show up on yours. But you know, also how you choose models you know, how young people want to see people reflected, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's true, so maybe it is relevant. Yeah, yeah. okay, um, all right, and yeah, final question, to what extent, you know you started yesterday talking about um, how when Steve came in, there was a new purpose born about uh, empowering sustainable and active lifestyles. To what extent was strategic foresight informing that, or to what extent were you looking at your mission, you know, to try and work out which trends were relevant to that? Was there any kind of chicken and egg type type piece? Yeah, I mean, technically, we did this work after we had established the purpose. So this is about maybe eighteen months old. Um, so uh, it was separate, uh, but certainly reinforcing of each other. And I, I think as we think about our opportunity spaces, and I gave you one example, we're very much using purpose as a filter for the kinds of things that we would go into. So we debated in our leadership team, we went through all of the opportunity spaces and we took some off the table because we said they were inconsistent with our purpose. But also, is it possible to use this to kind of, you know, that, that purpose is different from when, uh, uh, you know, VF 10 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. So purpose gets uh, refreshed. Mm -hmm. Is it also a way of a, a way of kind of looking back on on who you on who you need to be as an could organization? Be. Yeah, it could be. I mean, purpose ultimately is found within, so it really needs to be in the heart of the founder and the founding team and the current leadership team. Uh, but you you could use these as a stimulus to say, is there something that we can stand for? One of these needs through these trends that we can meet that maybe we're not thinking of. So sure you could. Yeah, great. All right. Okay, thank you so much. All right, David. thank awesome. you. Appreciate it.